Jesus said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for the power of your Holy Spirit to shake our lives like that loud noise. Move our hearts and our minds. Father, we need a movement of the Holy Spirit in each of us to receive you, to claim you as Lord and Savior, to understand Scripture. And so open up our hearts, open up our minds, soften us this morning to receive your Spirit. Pour it out on us. Open me up, Father. Empty me of myself. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our strength. You are our salvation. And all God's people say, Well, we're going to spend the next few weeks, uh, the next two weeks, uh, dwelling in the season of Christmas. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to go Christmas yet. Dwelling in the season of Thanksgiving. Season of Thanksgiving. I'm going to do kind of a mini uh, sermon series for the next two weeks. I'm going to preach this, today about Thanksgiving. I'm going to preach next week about Thanksgiving. Today we're going to talk about the why and the who we thank. And next week, I'm going to be preaching on the how we live lives of thanks, how we are to go about our day-to-day -day thanking God, what that actually means. So I think it's easy to say, well, thank the Lord, you know, let, how do, you know, but how does that function? And so next week, we're going to talk about kind of the practicality of that. But today, we are at the why and the who. Well, when I think back to elementary school, the best crafts, my favorite colored paper projects, were at Thanksgiving. Come on, the handprint that we turn into a turkey, the crepe paper tails, the pilgrim hat, which always brings to mind one of my favorite jokes. Why did the pilgrim's pants fall down? Belt buckles on his hat. <laughs> the season of Thanksgiving gets almost overlooked. It feels kind of like we go from Halloween to Christmas, and maybe Thanksgiving gets overlooked because it's tough to sell us things with the catchphrase, be thankful. <laughs> I know, I know there's Black Friday, but that's sort of a Thanksgiving parasite. It just kind of isn't related. It just gets tagged on. I want to focus on the act of being and living with the attitude of gratitude, because as Christians, Thanksgiving is way more than a yearly holiday. Thanksgiving is actually a calling. It's part of who we are to be as Christian people. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, if you've never underlined it in your Bibles and you have your own Bibles with you, turn to 1 Thessalonians 5.18, because there in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, you'll hear this. You can start at 17 if you wanted to, or 16. Rejoice always, pray continually. 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will. Ephesians 5, 19 and 20, you don't have to go there, but that 1 Thessalonians underline it. Ephesians 5, 19 and 20 says this, Sing, make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving is an important, even crucial part of being a follower of Jesus Christ. So let's allow the Gospel of Luke to instruct us in the way of thanksgiving and understand this morning the why and the who of the Christian attitude of gratitude. I know that's kind of cliche, but it works. So Luke 17, it's a great story for us to see the why and the who, why we are to be thankful and who we are to thank. In fact, the story of the 10 lepers is really your story and my story as well. This is our story, the story of the 10 lepers. This is about us. Now at first glance, it sounds like this is a story about healing. And even though it contains physical healing, I argue that this lesson is not about healing, really. It's about thanksgiving. It is about thankfulness. So let's dive in. 
How do we find these folks when we first encounter them? Turn to the 17th chapter of Luke. What's their condition when Jesus encounters them? They had leprosy. They were diseased, they were infected, and they were dying. Leprosy now is a skin condition. Many of you know uh, kind of the, the, what leprosy is. Uh, but it, it is a, it's, a, it's a horrible disease. It probably, when, when they talk about leprosy in the Bible, there was probably many skin conditions that were lumped under leprosy. When you look at Leviticus chapter 13 and it talks about skin diseases, there are a number of diseases that are kind of included in that, and it's kind of lumped together as leprosy. But it was a horrible diagnosis, not only for what it meant for your body physically, what it was going to do to you, but it was a horrible diagnosis for you as an individual because it meant some terrible things for your day-to-day -day life. In Leviticus chapter 13, you don't have to go there, uh, but this is, this is uh, towards the end of Leviticus chapter 13, it says this, Anyone with such defiling disease must wear torn cloth and let their hair be unkept, cover the lower parts of their face, and cry out as they walk along, Unclean! Unclean! And as long as they have the disease, they remain unclean, and they must live alone. They must live outside the camp. Ooh, the disease separated them from the ones they loved, from their homes, from their communities. Pastor Dave, you said this story is our, is our story. How can that be? Um, I don't have leprosy. At least I didn't before we shook hands this morning. Well, like these lepers, we too have a similar diagnosis. Listen to me. Each of us, you and I, have a deadly infection. It's called sin. Existential Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, one of my favorite Christian philosophers, called sin a sickness unto death. In other words, a sickness that leads to death. The condition we are under, the, the leprosy of our soul, the sin that all of us find ourselves plagued by is a progressive illness that leads to death. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Without the antidote, we're doomed. The leprosy of the soul, sin, how does it lead to death? Well, it separates us from the ones we love, and there's a dying when we're not with our community, right? When you're, when you're not able to be with your home, and they're not able to be with your people, there's a sense of, of death. But even more than that, it separates us from God, which in Scripture is death. In fact, hell is ultimate separation from God. Now, we could go on and on. Here's, here's what it says in Isaiah 59, verses 2 and 3. In fact, you can go to Isaiah 59 if you want. Big um, prophet in the, New, in the Old Testament, Isaiah 59, says this, verses 1 and 2. Surely the arm of the Lord, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. For your hands are stained with blood, your fingers with guilt, your lips have spoken falsely, and your tongue mutters wicked things. Your tongue mutters wicked things. Romans 3.23 just puts it like, Paul says it like this, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now we could go on and on in Scripture to look at that, but the fact is this, sin infected all of humanity, and it's not just the dusting. It goes to the very level of our DNA. Turn to Psalm 51. Middle of the Old Testament, kind of looks like it's the middle of your Bible. Psalm 51, verse 3 says this, For I know my transgression, and my sin is always before me, Psalm 51, 4, against you, God, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so you are right in your verdict and justified when you judged. Surely, listen, verse 5, I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. I was born this way. 
brokenness of humanity, the leprosy of the soul, the sin that infects, goes to the very level of our DNA. It's not like a two-year-old gets corrupted by sin and gets kind of, it's, it's right in who we are. So we can see that in Scripture, but we know it's true in our own lives. We know it in a practical way. How long can you go? How long can you go living a sinless life? 20 minutes? An hour? Three? A day? We're in trouble. We are in trouble. Like the lepers, me, you, all of us, apart from Jesus, are dying of sin. Sin has separated us from God, who says to us in Scripture, Be holy because I am holy. And sin has not also separated us from God, it separated us from one another. The lepers knew they were dying. They knew they needed to be saved. So what did they do? Let's go to Luke 17. Luke chapter 17 again. As Jesus was going into a village, verse 12, ten men who had leprosy met him and they stood at a distance. Of course, remember reading from, from Leviticus, they have to stand off at a distance. They can't come near. They have to say, unclean, unclean. They stood off at a distance and they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now the word master in Greek here is epistases. The word in Greek for master is epistases. It literally means commander, chief, one who is over. So in a sense, what is, what is being said when they call out is this. Jesus, chief commander, you oversee all things. Have pity on us. Jesus, his fame had spread. They must have heard about his commanding of demons, his bringing of healing to people. But their confession, their cry, was their only hope for being restored and, and brought back to life. It is a desperate plea. But it is a plea, it is a plea, <coughs> shouted out to the right person with the authority to change the situation. Amen? Acts 4.12 says this, there is no other name that can save. Acts 4.12, there's no other name that can save. Okay. Jesus says it like this, turn to John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, it's probably pretty familiar to many of you, John 14. John 14 verse 1 talks about, um, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. You know that, right? Those, those verses, they're pretty familiar. Uh, it says, if I go and prepare a place for you, verse 3, I'll come back and I'll take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am and you know the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, that's why Jesus is uh, either the Son of God and is who he says he is, or he's a complete lunatic. Jesus is not a great moral teacher. You can't say he's not the Son of God, but I think he's a really great guy. You can't be a really great moral teacher and claim to be the Son of God. You're nuts if that's not who you are. But you see, Jesus is the only way with the antidote for sin, the cure for the sickness unto death. Jesus is the only way that we can be restored back into a relationship with the Father. To the Father, we have a relationship through Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can heal the sin we commit against each other through forgiveness and by forgiveness restore community and relationship to one another and to the Father. Are you under the burden of sin today? Is the leprosy of the soul consuming you? Do you feel alone or outcast because of your brokenness? Are you separated from the ones you love because of sin, addiction or lies? Is sin reigning in your heart? Is it killing you or do you feel separated from God? Are you dying? Well, the lepers from our story have set out a precedent for us. What do they do? In the realization 
that they had nowhere to turn. They cried out to God, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. When you do this, when you call out to God, knowing there's no other way to go, your salvation comes. Forgiveness washes you. The antidote is delivered. Turn to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. Verse 1. You can put a parenthesis around these verses 1 through 4. I love the Lord, for He, what? He heard my voice. He, what? Heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. You see, remember? Sin had turned his face away from us. Remember we just we read that earlier? Sin had turned his, his, his face away from us from 59. Well, when we call out, his ear turns towards us. Because he has turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. Isn't that beautiful? He hears our cry and he restores our hope and our life. Remember I, I said earlier that, that Romans 6.23 says um, the wages of sin is death. There's a comma after that. In Romans 6.23, the sentence is this, the wages for the wages of sin is death, comma, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go home tonight and underline Romans 6.23 because it speaks a great reality of why we thank him and who we thank. Our thanks flow out of this truth that when we see our sickness, the truth of our position, and we call out to Jesus, he will by grace and with love heal the sickness of our souls. We will be saved. The antidote to sin is the cross. The antidote to sin is the cross. You see, when we realize this, it's the beginning of true thanksgiving, an attitude of gratitude. When sin meets the cross, we start. Thankfulness can begin. And there's so much to be thankful for. But it's one thing to know the gift. As a friend of mine says, it's quite another thing to know the giver. That's where true thanksgiving reigns and where, our tr where we are literally transformed into living lives of thanksgiving. Not just when we realize the gift, but when we know who the giver is. Look at Luke chapter 17 again. Look at verse 15. One of them, the lepers, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet, and he thanked him. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus asked him, we're not all ten, ten cleansed? Where, where are the other nine? It's, to me, that just sounds heartbreaking. Weren't, weren't there ten? Where, where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? See, the nine ran off to satisfy the law, to show themselves and restore their status in the community. If you read, read Leviticus chapter 13, that's how you get back into the community. You've got to go show yourself to the priests and show that those uh, lacerations and those things have healed. And then the, only the priest can say, come on back in. So those nine ran off to satisfy the law, to get themselves back home. One. One, realize that grace and the love of God had transformed him, and he returned to give thanks. One, realize that Jesus was truly the master, that all things are under him, all power and all authority, and since he knew who cleansed him, Jesus, God in the flesh, he was compelled to run back and praise him, to give thanks for the grace, hope, and life that had now been extended to him. 
9, it says, Jesus says, we're cleansed. I would say only one was healed. <laughs> Nine celebrated, but one lived thankfully, knowing what had been done and who had done it. A life lived in thanks is a life that is vibrant, engaged, and humble. Humble because you see life as a gift and you long to use all that you have to please the giver, to give thanks and praise to the one that set you free. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul describes the radical life change of gratitude that we Christians are to live. Paul teaches us in 4, at verse 4, Philippians 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When Paul is talking about here, it goes way beyond reacting with gratitude or thanks to God for what God has done. Listen, this is radical. Paul uses the word thanksgiving in the text. Look at it. Philippians 4. Paul uses thanksgiving in the text to speak of how we should approach God before God has ever done anything. Look again. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Do you hear it? He hasn't done anything yet. We are to approach him with thanksgiving. This is radical. This is Psalm 23 sort of stuff here. He prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Psalm 23, one of my favorite parts of that psalm. He prepares a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. The uncertainty exists. The enemies are near. The struggle is right in front of us. And yet, what we see as Christians prepared before us is a victory table. We find ourselves in the midst of struggles that we can't understand, and yet we call out to God and we talk with God, approaching Him with an attitude of hope and gratitude, knowing that He's good, that He's loving, and that no matter what the end result of the situation is, He will hold us eternally in His hands. The situation might not go as we had planned or as we thought. It may not go as we want it to go, but we trust that Jesus has the ultimate hands, that in His hands... In his hands are justice and mercy and grace and love. The world is in the middle of the battle, and the forces of darkness can make us think that the outcome is still yet to be determined. We're determined. We're not sure what's going to happen here. But in Jesus, we see the end. Amen? What will be? We see the victory. Even if it's unclear at the moment which side is the upper hand in our life, we know the end of the story. It's already been done. Jesus said it on the cross. It is finished. The end of the story is Jesus Christ. The end of the story is praise and life and thanksgiving in Jesus Christ. Knowing who to thank and why we thank him. What he has done for us is an attitude adjusting, life changing. It is a total transformation as we make that realization. Ten leopards were cleansed, but one life was transformed through thanksgiving and praise. Seeing the gift, knowing the giver, he was made well. Are you burdened? Are you broken? Are you under the crushing weight of sin? I invite you this morning to come and be made well. Jesus hears your cry. He has the antidote. Jesus is the antidote. See the gift and meet the giver and be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit into a life that lives thank fully for all that God has done through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the gifts this morning that you bring to us the gift of hope, the gift of peace, the gift of life. We lift up our voices crying out, have mercy on us, Lord. And as we do, we know and trust that you come to us to save us, to lift us, to give us life. So, Father, come in Jesus' name. And all God's people say...